Hello and welcome back to the Sinobubble podcast. In today's episode, I thought we could talk a little bit about Hong Kong and give a bit of a belated update on everything that's been going on there in the past year or so. For those of you who don't know, I actually used to live in Hong Kong between 2017 and 2020. And while I was there, I covered some of the protests that were going on in 2019 and 2020 in response to the extradition bill and then the introduction of the national security law. So those are on the podcast. It's kind of like a mini series. And in one of the episodes, I do actually talk to a protester as well and kind of get his views on why the protests are taking place and also what he feels the future of Hong Kong will be as a result. I do talk about Hong Kong a little bit in my newsletters as well. However, I haven't really spoken about Hong Kong in detail since last year, maybe even the year before. So I thought it'd be a good idea to just kind of bring everybody back up to speed with what's been going on there. And just in general, I think Hong Kong, a bit like Taiwan, is an interesting case study into China's political theory and also kind of their cultural theory as well. The idea of what it means to be Chinese and how China exercises its rights and its powers and its sovereignty where the people don't necessarily 100% agree with Beijing's rule. So it's just interesting to kind of understand it from a political theory perspective as well. Before I just dive into what's been going on more recently, I thought it might be helpful to give just a little bit of background and context on what's been going on for the past three or four years now. For people who don't know about the protests, essentially in 2019, the Chinese government tried to introduce an extradition bill in Hong Kong. The basis for this was essentially a young man called Chan Tongkai, murdered his pregnant girlfriend Poon Hui Wing in Taiwan and then fled back to Hong Kong. So at the time Taiwan and Hong Kong didn't have um, like an extradition treaty between them. Chan couldn't be extradited back to Taiwan to be prosecuted even though he admitted to being guilty of the murder. The pro-Beijing party in Hong Kong used this case as a precedent to say that there should be a blanket extradition bill whereby Hong Kongers can be extradited to any country regardless of whether or not they have a legal agreement with Hong Kong. However, legal experts in Hong Kong basically said that this would open the floodgates to allow Hong Kongers to be extradited under sort of, not false pretenses, but essentially it would allow Hong Kongers to be open and liable to laws that didn't apply to them in Hong Kong. So for example, if you violated say this free speech law of one country, you would end up being extradited to that country even though you had committed that crime in Hong Kong. This is the thing that they were worried about. This was especially worrisome as at the time Hong Kong and mainland China didn't have an extradition bill between them. And so people were worried that this would allow Beijing to exercise more of its legal and judicial powers on Hong Kong more directly as opposed to through the one country two systems as it had been. This was particularly worrying to practitioners of British common law in Hong Kong, who said that the Chinese system was plagued by deep flaws, including a lack of independent judiciary, arbitrary detention, lack of fair public trial, lack of access to legal representation and poor prison conditions. There was a lot of back and forth about this extradition bill, and this eventually led to protests taking place throughout the summer and winter of 2019 in Hong Kong. The start of the protests were mainly peaceful. I actually attended a few myself. They were basically just marches from one side of Hong Kong to the other, people holding up banners and chanting and calling for Carrie Lam, who was the chief executive of Hong Kong at the time, to step down from her position. They became increasingly more violent as there were clashes between the police and particularly young people, students who felt very strongly about the extradition bill. At one point, university campuses were completely closed down in early 2020, partly due to COVID, but also because students had actually taken over several campuses and sort of put up blockades to stop the police going in. Um, And then there were several police raids on these campuses. I remember I used to live next to a campus and one night the police raided it with tear gas and we were tear gassed in our own apartment and it was all very dramatic. And there were people sort of abseiling out of windows and things like that. So. It got very serious towards the end of the protests, which is why the Beijing government decided to step in with the national security bill. In June of 2020, after the protests had been taking place for around a year, the 
Beijing government basically said that they were going to introduce the national security law in Hong Kong. And so the point of the national security law, according to Beijing, was to bring back stability to the island. They said that it was to stem the growing risk of separatism and restore order in the Hong Kong a special administrative region so the city's residents could resume normal economic and other activities. Of course, due to COVID, these normal economic and everyday activities would not resume. Um, however, they were basically talking about reopening universities and preventing people from, you know, wearing protest clothing, like black masks and things like that, and the right to stop and search anyone who they felt was suspicious and just generally prevent people from per protesting in general because obviously in China you do not have the right to protest however you did in Hong Kong but under the national security law you no longer would. The national security law in general is very broad. It uses words like sedition, collusion, subversion however it doesn't give many definitions for these words. I talked about this in the last podcast episode on Russia-China relations and also a little bit in the Belt and Road episode as well where I basically said that when Beijing introduces a new law it tends to be very broad because practical implementation on the ground is going to vary quite widely from region to region especially in China where you've got such big differences in sort of economic status or cultural differences or just you know access to resources from you know north to south east to west province to province region to region village to village so you can't be too specific at a central level because it that implementation won't work on a local practical level another reason for it being broad is obviously so that people can pick and choose when something does apply so for example sedition can be anything from actively arranging a group of people who say we want to undermine the government and overthrow it and you know hold a revolution to somebody who posts something online saying something negative about the government and we'll get on to more examples in a little bit as well. I've also covered the national security law in a previous newsletter so if you're interested in reading more about what it actually says and how it can be understood or interpreted you can head over to the Substack and read more about it there for that context. So the major thing that's happening in Hong Kong at the moment is something called the trial of the Hong Kong 47. We need to go back a bit again to 2020 to kind of understand what that is. In 2020, the Hong Kong LegCo or Legislative Council elections were due to take place. Um, the LegCo being the sort of one level parliamentary system that governs Hong Kong. Within this ledge code there are kind of two camps. You've got like the pro-Beijing camp and the pro-democracy camp who were a bit more scattered. There's kind of lots of different parties. However, the pro-democracy camp basically decided amongst themselves that they wanted to get as many people in parliament as possible so that they could act as effective opposition to any bills that Beijing just wanted to implement without the people's sort of consent or without effective opposition. So what they did is that they organised primaries so that they could find out who were the most popular candidates and who would be the most likely to win come election time. The primaries were very, very successful. Around 600,000 people showed up and voted. However, even though at the time they were technically legal, the Beijing government kept warning the pro-democracy candidates that what they were doing could be considered illegal, could be considered seditious. And they were warned many times to stop. Many people who attended were threatened. Some people were even arrested during uh, the voting. However, over the two day period, things seemed to sort of be carried off without really a hitch. This was all until basically the Beijing government decided that actually, yeah, what they were doing was illegal under the new national security law. And so the 2020 elections were cancelled by Carrie Lam. She said it was due to COVID cases, sort of an uptick in COVID cases. However, most people do think it was due to the sort of seditious primary campaigns held by the pro-democratic camp. And because of this, around 55 or 54 people were arrested in January 2021 under the national security law for conspiracy to commit subversion. So in other words, to 
undermine the democratic processes within Hong Kong. The elections were moved to the end of 2021, and at the same time, the number of seats in the LegCo was expanded. So originally there were 70 seats, and then Beijing decided that the total number would become 90. Now, you may think, oh, this is really good for the Democrats because that means that they have the opportunity to win more seats. However, according to how the seats were actually changed, the seats that were directly elected would be reduced from 35 to 20. So that's directly elected by the people of Hong Kong through direct voting. The five directly elected district council seats would be removed and an additional 40 seats would be elected by the pro-Beijing election committee and 30 seats would remain trade-based functional constituencies. Every candidate must have nominations from each of the five sectors in the election committee. Even just reading that very brief paragraph, you know immediately that there's no way that the pro-democratic people could even stand for election if they had to be approved first by this election committee, let alone win any election that actually took place. There were other rules that were brought in as well, for example, to test the patriotism of each of the candidates, you had to make sort of like a pledge. And this also eventually led to the majority, if not all pro-democratic standing, or sorry, sitting councillors step down from their positions. And then after the 2021 elections, there were no pro-democratic councillors within the LegCo at all. So if we fast forward to the current day, as of February 6th, the trial of the so-called Hong Kong 47 has officially begun. These are the people who were arrested for holding the primaries all the way back in 2020. As of today, 31 of these subversive people have actually already pled guilty to the charges and four of them have agreed to testify for the prosecution which actually leaves only 16 people standing for trial if convicted because the charges essentially you were trying to overthrow the government they could face up to life imprisonment which does explain why 31 people have pled guilty maybe they uh, were agreeing to accept lesser charges for that as well um, but the details of that haven't been released yet. The trial's been going on for about a month or so now. Not a lot of information has been released. The public can actually attend in the gallery and view the court case. However, apparently there's been sort of suspicions that people are being paid to sort of stand in the line and take up space or to actually sit and watch and prevent the general public from attending or maybe like people from the pro-democratic camp from attending. So... There's been reports of people being, like, seeing people being paid money <laughs> to um, join the queue and then leave before the case even begins. And people are queuing for days and days and getting really annoyed about this. It's very difficult to say whether or not this is being organised by, say, Beijing or just, like, individual bad actors who are trying to disrupt the proper proceedings of things. They did manage to track down one guy who was clearly involved in paying people off. However, he also seemed to be trying to dodge the police. So it seems that he wasn't being paid by Beijing to do that. Or it's not really clear, basically. So it's kind of something we need to keep an eye on. But it does seem like people are trying to sort of disrupt public or even press access to the court proceedings. Something I was very curious about was how the trial was being portrayed in Chinese media. Um, it's not talked about a lot, as you can imagine, and I couldn't really find anything about it in the sort of typical everyday press, you know, things like the China Daily, People's Daily, who are the direct mouthpieces of the CCP. However, I did find something in the Global Times, which is always very reliable when it comes to critiquing critiques of Beijing, so to speak. So in one Global Times article, the author writes, The ultimate intention of these suspects was to take power in Hong Kong by using loopholes in the city's electoral system and then seek independence by colluding with external forces. Even in that small sentence, there's so much to unpack. Um, so the idea of them trying to take power in Hong Kong uh, by using loopholes, <laughs> construing the actual legal democratic processes that are extant in a territory as a loophole 
is a very interesting way of construing the situation. Also the idea of them taking power. Is it taking power if you are democratically elected? I'm not sure. It's very interesting how they're using very specific language to try and show the things that they, they were doing as like sneaky or you know power hungry, almost megalomanic when they were actually just following the sort of you know the procedures that they could follow in order to increase the number of votes it's not like they were paying people to vote for them they were just holding primaries to find popular candidates it's a very normal proceeding that's how for example the american electoral system works you know they have primaries for like a year and a half before they even select who's going to run for president so these are not like crazy wacky or you know suspicious things that they were doing they were doing it very openly and the idea that they were trying to seek independence as well is kind of lumping all of the democratic parties into one basket together. A lot of the Democrats are not actually seeking independence from China. Some of them are. However, some of them are more realistic, uh, especially the ones who have been elected in on previous occasions. They, they're they seeking more to represent the voices of the Hong Kong people within the entire Chinese system as opposed to kind of being subsumed into kind of the centralized system that you know China runs on in the mainland under the party state. They're essentially seeking an extension of the one country, two systems system instead of you know erasing Hong Kong's kind of identity and political culture. So saying that they're seeking independence is kind of a stretch. Something else that the article says, which I really, <laughs> I really like this part, the biggest problem was that they seemingly conducted this legally under the city's previous legal and election system. That's why Hong Kong has to reform its electoral system and the central government has to clarify the bottom line of the national security law for Hong Kong to prevent similar crimes in the future. That's an incredible statement to me because it literally goes in the first sentence from what they did was legal to the second sentence, which is what they did was a crime. And so you can follow the logic of these sorts of sta statements and see that what Beijing is essentially saying is that, yes, at the time, what they did was legal. So what we had to do was basically make that illegal <laughs> and so that they can never do something like that again. So they're essentially admitting, although I'm not sure to whom they're admitting this, they're essentially admitting that they actively changed the law so that people could not undermine them in the future in any way. If you had that sort of omission in the Western press, the Western media would be going crazy, but in China, that's just sort of business as usual. It's a one party state. And so anything that undermines the one party state is obviously not allowed. So obviously we have to make it criminal for you to try and stand up against the one party state. It's written as if it's, you know, par for the course. But yeah, reading that as a Westerner who lives in a country with rule of law and a strong judicial system, it's just incredible <laughs> to me. Apart from this trial of the Hong Kong 47, there have been other fallouts from the national security law as well. So one Hong Kong Free Press article writes that as of February of this year, 17,243 people have been arrested over suspected acts and activities that endangered national security since the legislation was enacted on June 30th, 2020. Among those, 149 people and five companies have been charged. According to the Security Bureau, 62 people have been convicted or are awaiting sentencing. Among them, 26 have been convicted or awaiting sentencing under the Beijing imposed law. Separately, the Correctional Services Department revealed in its annual review that 22 people were admitted to correctional institutes last year under the national security law. So people have been arrested from everything from selling books that were apparently seditious to posting things on social media that were apparently seditious or showed that they were, say, colluding with foreign powers. And again, it's all very broadly defined, right? So that people can be picked up as and when they need to be. Colluding with foreign powers could include anything from, you know, being affiliated with a foreign company to you're a charity that receives investment from foreign companies as well. So it's very broad. Recently, one part of it was defined and that was the barring of foreign lawyers in national security cases. Um, this applies to the case of Jimmy Lai, who's like a huge, famous Hong Kong tycoon 
had a clothing company, also had a media company called Apple Daily, which is one of the many newspapers that's been closed down for being, again, seditious. He wanted to have a British lawyer. However, the current chief executive of Hong Kong, John Lee, has basically had a rule enacted whereby you can't have foreign lawyers in national security cases. It's not entirely clear as to why that is, but my suspicion would be that the national security law is a Chinese law and British common law does not apply in these cases. In many of the cases, there's no jury trial either. They're just judge trials, like a panel of judges. Because the precedent of the national security law is not based on the rule, rule of law, it's not based on English common law, having a British lawyer doesn't really work. That's another way in which certain parts of the law can be picked up on. And, you know, perhaps they're, they're saying that under the idea of foreign collusion or like foreign people meddling in Chinese domestic affairs that shouldn't be allowed so yeah it's interesting how small parts of the law are picked up on and defined as and when it's necessary another example of how the national security law is sort of affecting the governance of hong kong teachers have been given a new set of guidelines that will essentially see their moral standards and understanding of um the national security law tested and principals or people who are applying to become principals of schools will also have to undergo a sort of national security loyalty patriotism test as well. Interestingly, over 900 civil servants have actually quit their jobs in just three months in 2022, a lot of whom were teachers and policemen, obviously not wanting to have to undergo these new strict requirements. In terms of policemen, obviously the Hong Kong police went from being like the top rated in Asia to coming under huge fire for like human rights violations, both domestically and internationally. They've been, you know, under a lot of scrutiny recently. So I would completely understand how a lot of just ordinary policemen would be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be sort of looked down on or castigated or attacked for trying to do my job. They may not necessarily agree with um, the new work that they have to do as well, sort of stopping and searching young people who look like they might be on their way to protest or doing something suspicious. This is causing a huge uptick in the number of civil service jobs in Hong Kong that they're struggling to fill. Another high profile but less sort of bombastic case that's going on as well is that two editors from Stand News, which again is another seditious newspaper that had to be closed down in Hong Kong, are on trial at the moment for trying to publish or actually publishing 17 seditious articles. That's another case that I think we can closely monitor on the podcast next time we do an update. That one's quite interesting to me. Reading some of the articles and again seeing how the idea of something being seditious is picked up on just from little snippets or you know, here and there. So yeah, maybe that's something that we can talk about in later episodes as well. Apart from national security stuff, what else has been going on in Hong Kong? The main thing is the end of quarantining and face masks for people. As of, I think, a few Wednesdays ago, by the time you guys are watching this, the face mask mandate in Hong Kong has finally been lifted after like three years, over a thousand days, according to some websites. This is one of the longest mask mandates in the world. They were one of the first countries to introduce it, obviously being closest to the site of the spread of the infection. And they ended it even after other Asian countries with very strict requirements ended their own mandates as well. There's also a requirement for people coming into Hong Kong to stay in quarantine for 21 days, which was extremely disruptive and has caused major problems for Hong Kong's economy and also the tourism. Now Hong Kong is very much concentrating on boosting its tourism and economy again, which is again in line with what China is trying to do now that they've opened up. For example, they have a scheme going on where they're giving away 500,000 plane tickets to overseas visitors as part of a $2 billion campaign to revive tourism after three years. Just to give you an idea of how bad uh, things have gone in Hong Kong, apparently in December of 2022, arrivals in Hong Kong were only 5% of what they were in December 2019, uh, which is pretty bad. According to John Lee, the chief executive of Hong Kong, Hong Kong is now seamlessly connected to the mainland of China and the whole international world. 
There'll be no isolation, quarantine, no restrictions on experiencing our great wine and dine scene, on doing business, and enjoying the hustle and bustle of Asia's wild city. That's what Hong Kong is concentrating on now. But obviously another problem that Hong Kong is facing, apart from people not arriving, is a lot of people leaving. There have been quite a few articles in the past few years about a brain drain going on in Hong Kong. Apparently this year, Hong Kong's population has dropped for a third year straight, with a net outflow of 60,000 residents contributing to a decline of nearly 1% in 2022. A lot of people are going to places like Canada, Australia, Taiwan, Singapore, the UK and the US. Apparently Canada's immigration authorities said that visa applications from Hong Kongers had jumped up more than 10% in 2019 to 8,640. Obviously there's a whole number of reasons why lots of people want to leave Hong Kong, one of them being very strict COVID restrictions. In general there have been fewer births than deaths, about half as many births as deaths in the last year or so. Usually this is covered as well by expats coming in, but expats have not been coming in and having kids, they've been leaving. And also problems of immigration of um, the domestic workers in Hong Kong, who make up a very large proportion of non-permanent residents. So these tend to be women from places like Thailand and the Philippines who come and live in Hong Kong families' houses and act as like nannies and maids. A lot of them were basically prevented from even coming over in the first place due to strict quarantine rules and a lot of them had to leave because if they got COVID you know they were not allowed to stay at home. A lot of them were kicked out of their homes and also a lot of them were not allowed to take the one day off a week which is Sunday that they usually had during the pandemic to go and hang out with their friends. They were forced to stay inside basically for three years, which led a lot of them to leave. According to the government, there's a lot of people going abroad for study and work. However, people are not actually required to declare why they're leaving Hong Kong when they leave. So that's just speculation on the government's part. Another piece of speculation is that a lot of le people are leaving due to the national security law and tighter restrictions being introduced by Beijing. Personally, I know people who have left for this reason. Um, we actually have friends who moved to the UK recently. I think they moved here in 2020 or was it? Yeah, late 2020, early 2021. The reason that they left was simply because they felt that Hong Kong was just changing too much under China's sort of tightening grip on the country. It was becoming much more Chinese and less Hong Kong in their opinion. And they felt that there would be fewer opportunities for their children to be able to get on, potentially more uh, competition directly with mainlanders who were coming to Hong Kong and just, you know, less freedoms in general for their family in the future. China is now looking to close this sort of brain gap, if you will. For example, they've introduced a new visa regulation that will allow people to move more freely within the Greater Bay Area. So like between Shenzhen and Macau and Hong Kong. And that will help sort of the flow of business expertise, things like that, especially in terms of IT, R&D, medicine, the things that are very important to China at the moment. But I think it's also important to note that not everyone is sort of fleeing the new Chinese regime. A lot of people in Hong Kong in general are just wanting to leave Hong Kong because of the way Hong Kong is. So Hong Kong is an extremely expensive place, if you didn't know that already. The housing market is completely inaccessible and impossible and it's also very tiny and crowded. Like London is very expensive but in Hong Kong the price of a one bedroom house would be the same as like a four bedroom house in London. So it's crazy expensive. There aren't a lot of childcare provisions as well which is actually one of the reasons that we left Hong Kong. Unless you have a live-in nanny which of course you would have to pay for and they're not paid very well as well. That's a very sort of shady under economy of Hong Kong and they're treated just really horribly. I volunteered for a domestic workers charity while I was in Hong Kong and some of their stories were just so appalling. And just in general, the cost of living in Hong Kong can be really prohibitively expensive unless you've got a really, really good job. It's just hard to get on. So a lot of people in Hong Kong are actually moving to China. They're moving to what they would consider sort of less developed cities in the Greater Bay Area, in Southern China, where people also speak Cantonese. The culture is a little bit more similar. And even though the areas are what they would consider less developed than Hong Kong, they are still 
better developed in general and so people feel a bit more comfortable moving to those areas or studying or working there and then coming back to Hong Kong perhaps later on. I think the migration between Hong Kong and the mainland but also Taiwanese people to the mainland as well which we're going to talk about perhaps in the next episode about sort of the probability of China invading Taiwan and why that won't happen is because on a sort of day-to-day relational interpersonal level between these you know the average Hong Kong or the average Taiwanese person they don't have a lot of actual conflict with people on the mainland and like most people in the world they're just trying to get by they're trying to you know get the highest level of educational attainment they can they're trying to get on in their careers and their love lives as that's made easier by the Chinese government you actually see a higher uptake in these work study schemes in visa applications in the ability to buy property in China not less so it's not as if the more China imposes on these places the less people are interested in going to China from their perspective China has actually a lot of opportunities for them and again the cultural similarities mean that it's easier for them to integrate than saying going really far abroad going to western countries and trying to set up an entirely new life there very far away from their families. When looking at Hong Kong apart from just looking at the political perspective it's also important to look at the economic and social relations that people have there, the culture that people have in trying to get on. I think Hong Kong to an extent at least when I was there it felt like it had lost a bit of its attraction a little bit of its glow I know in especially in the 90s when expats used to get these amazing packages to get like a house and a car and an amazing job and move out to Hong Kong I think those days are definitely over Hong Kong in general is just less attractive and even I think if you compare it to China you know you might say well they're under the same regime now but renting and the cost of living in China is a lot more affordable. There is a lot more space. Mainland China is actually developing a lot quicker than Hong Kong. A lot of Hong Kong's infrastructure, although it's, you know, things like their public transport is amazing. You can see, for example, the housing stock quality isn't that great. When people are evaluating in the future, you know, would I rather move to Hong Kong or would I rather stay in Hong Kong or try out somewhere in mainland China that's, you know, growing really quickly and has all these opportunities and is offering me like a free scholarship to university which one would I choose I think you might see an even bigger drop off in Hong Kong which is really a shame because it is a great place with great people and a great culture great nightlife and it's super safe but yeah it's a shame that it's basically just not what it used to be but we will continue to monitor the situation in Hong Kong that's everything that I have to update you on today Thanks very much for listening to this podcast. Don't forget that we have a Substack as well. So I put out a weekly newsletter. By the time you see this episode, I think the last one or two would have been a book review I did about a political theory book. So if you're interested in reading that, you can head over to Substack. Don't forget, you can also support the podcast by giving a donation on our Buy Me A Coffee site. It really helps to support the development of the show. It allows me to keep researching, bringing you fresh updates as well. And yeah, you know, leave comments for me as well. Feel free to write to me. I love hearing from you guys and hearing your ideas about what we should talk about next on the podcast. That's it for me, guys. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you all in the next episode.